Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, today here with me is uh, Mr. Gowdy, Mr. Trey Gowdy. He is a father, a former federal prosecutor and congressman uh, who lives in uh, South Carolina. So thank you so much for joining me today, Mr. Gowdy. I'm wondering how I got on the show when I heard you had scholars and other <laughs> business executives who made the mistake of booking me? Um, so, I mean, we are uh, very close to the election season, around you know eight days away. Uh, so we thought it would be nice to, to get some more uh, political people uh, to, to hear what's going on, uh, in, in, uh, like mostly your thoughts on, on where the country is headed, especially. So, yeah, uh, I, wish, I wish I knew, but we got <laughs> to figure it out. Uh, I, I suppose it's also because uh, we go to Princeton and Princeton is somewhat uh, of a liberal bubble, I guess, and, and it would be nice to, to hear perspectives that are often differ, different from uh, what our classmates and peers often hear about. So it's well, nice I to... think I think you all produce Ken Buck and Ted Cruz. <laughs> I think both, both of those guys are Princeton grads. So uh, I think I think we'll try to try to reach out as well. So yeah, it's, it's a, it sounds like a great start. So uh, to, to the to our elections coverage, but it, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you. Perhaps maybe we can start with some more lighthearted topic. Uh, your, your most recent book, it uh, doesn't hurt to ask using the power of questions to communicate, connect, and persuade. Um, it provides guidance to those who wish to become effective communicators. And you, yourself, your ability to communicate and persuade others has been at the forefront of your professional career. So uh, because you were a stellar uh, pro federal prosecutor uh, achieving some very high performance back, back in the day. So I'd love to hear a little bit more uh, of the reasons why you published this book. Um, maybe we can take it from there. Well, I mean, the first thing you have to decide as it relates to books is do I want to write one? Because it is labor and intensive. I mean, I, I write my own stuff. So, um, you know, do you, do you want to invest the time? And then what do you know enough about that you can uh, effectively communicate and people might be interested in? So when I look at the list of what do I know enough about, science is out the window, math is out the window, almost everything's out the window that I know enough to write a book about, except persuasion, because as you noted, um, for you know the better part of two decades, I was standing in front of 12 people that I didn't know, um, that knew nothing about the case, or else they couldn't be on the jury, and you have to persuade them or convince them by the highest evidentiary burden our culture has, which is beyond a reasonable doubt, and you have to convince all 12. You know, seven out of 12 is fantastic in politics. It's lousy in a courtroom. So Tim Scott, actually, who's my best friend in politics, T Tim Scott kind of pushed me um, to, to write a book on, I mean, it, it is about communication, but that subset of how to, how to persuade others. And, you know, I appreciate you mentioned in my record in the courtroom, good facts make good lawyers. I mean, if you have good facts, you should do well. And that's true in most of life. So, you know, if you're trying to persuade someone that the earth is flat, um, I don't care how good your rhetorical skills are. You're probably not going to be successful because your facts aren't very good. So, number one, you have to be uh, the queen or the king of the facts, both on your side and on the other side. I'm stunned at the number of people who spend very little time trying to understand how the other half or the other 80% or maybe the other 99% of the world views something, if you don't understand where your rhetorical opponent is coming from and what facts he or she is relying on, then you're not ever going to be an effective communicator. Mr. Gowdy, just to quickly respond to uh, your, your point about facts, don't you think we live in a world today where people can find whatever facts they want to support whatever opinion they believe in? I mean, It depends on how you define fact. Well, for example, uh, we, we talk about, when we evaluate a policy, let's say Trump's uh, most recent tax cut, the Democrats would say, oh, this exacerbates inequality, this makes rich pay people pay lower taxes, and then uh, the Republicans would find a, a very nice, solid other set of facts that say, no, 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 actually, look, if you look at it from this angle, uh, the rich people actually pay more tax, uh, middle class pay lower tax, so it seems that both sides have very convincing facts. Well, that's true in every trial. So it's uh, necessarily true in every argument. I mean, if, if you're totally devoid of facts, then I don't think you're going to make your way into the arena. 
Um, I never had a trial, but that there were not facts on the other side. It's a question of who has the most compelling facts and then who presents those. Um, yeah, I'm a big believer. I mean, emotion alone is never going to win a conversation, but you can marry a passion with logic. Um, and the better your facts are, um, the better you can kind of calibrate uh, which you need more of and which you should use less of. But yeah, I mean, when I hear the, the media in particular uh, use words like fact and evidence, there is evidence the earth is flat because the part that I'm on right now is. Um, it's just not good evidence. And from that, you would never want to extrapolate an argument that the earth is flat just because the room I happen to be standing in is. So yeah, there, there are facts on, I mean, every trial I ever had, the defense had some fact that the jury was supposed to deduce he or she did not commit the crime, but apparently their facts were not persuasive. Uh, this might be a slightly poignant question. I, I guess a lot of people would, would say uh, the Repu well, people on the left often say the Republicans or people on the right don't care about facts. President Trump's, uh, a lot of his uh, misinformation retweets online shows that they don't care about facts. Seven out of 10 uh, misinformation articles trending on social media are from conservative outlets and therefore they don't care about facts. Do, do you think it's that they don't care about facts or that they're simply not uh, presenting the convincing facts as you just talked about? I cannot, among my many limitations <laughs> in life, I cannot speak on behalf of what other people do and why they do it. Um, I, I don't mind being called dumb. Um, I don't mind if people think I'm not funny, although I think I am. I don't ever want, when you make a factual error, it, in, it decreases your credibility so much. So I would rather just take a pass than assert something that is uh, demonstrably or factually untrue. Um, I think, um, so I'm not one of those people that propagates information on, so, I mean, I rarely use social media. Uh, my guess is if I were anticipating what their argument was in response, which is always good to anticipate what the other side's gonna say, I think what they would say is, well, I wasn't vouching for the authenticity, I was just raising it as a point of discussion. I mean, that's not my style. I, I, I don't do that. There are plenty of ways to raise issues for discussion without propagating misinformation. Um, so look, I, 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 I didn't believe in the hale bop comment. Um, I don't believe in QAnon. I'm just, I'm not into those. I'm a prosecutor. I need, I need you to prove it to me beyond a reasonable doubt. And, right. and you know, a tweet is probably not going to do it. I guess a greater issue here is that psychology is at play, right? People often don't seek out the facts that they that disagree with and will prove them wrong, or that even if they are confronted with some set of more convincible, credible facts, they still don't want to change their beliefs. They don't want to update their beliefs. And uh, the recent 2020 presidential debate really gives rise to this idea that political officials are, are very unable to communicate with, with each other. Uh, and then when they debate, they can debate all day long but very few minds are actually changed. So uh, what do you think of this? Um, I think you raised two points. I mean, our society is in desperate need of a, of a referee, of an umpire, of someone um, or some entity, even if we may not like them, we respect them enough to call balls and strikes. And ideally that would be the role of the media but almost every media outlet is uh, associated with either the left or the right. I mean, I really can't think of one that we have not, or they have not marginalized themselves, or we have marginalized them into saying, well, that's a right-wing TV show, or that's a left-wing TV show. So who is the societal arbiter? I mean, if, we, if there really is a dispute over fact. Who do we go to? I mean, we can't go to court. I mean, we've, we've successfully politicized the courts. Um, the media has um, abdicated that role. Uh, you mentioned persuasion. Of course, there's no persuasion in politics um, because that's apparently not what the voters want. Um, so I, I, do, I don't blame the, I mean, I do blame people in politics a little bit, but also blame some, the demand. I mean, what do we have a demand for? Do we want to be persuaded? 
or do we like these 30 second attack ads where you try to take someone's 25 year you know career and public service and reduce it to the worst photo they've ever taken and a 30 second ad. And if that's what we want as a political process, then you're going to get about what we have now, which is a fractured country that is uninterested and being persuaded by the other side. I mean, you watch the debates. Did you get the feeling either candidate was really trying to persuade you or were they trying to just ratify or validate what you already believe? They were probably not trying to persuade each other or even persuade the voters. They were speaking to their own base often. Uh, right, well, let me ask you this question. You watch, do, you, do you ever watch football, college football, pro football? Uh, not, not too much, but okay. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> All right. Well, here, let me, let, let me tell you one thing that happens. Somebody will step out of bounds and we'll spend about three minutes with a replay official trying to make sure the ball's on the 33 and not the 34. We spend more time figuring out whether or not we have the ball marked than we do allowing presidential candidates to discuss very important issues. How absurd is it for me to say, healthcare is the number one issue on the American public's mind. Why don't you take two minutes and tell me what you think about it? Two minutes? That, that, that's the most that we have an attention span for on an issue like that? Racial justice, take two minutes. So the whole debate structure is calculated towards entertainment, not towards persuasion. They want to entertain you. This goes back to, um, I guess, the historical examples of when back in Lincoln's days, people would debate for hours on end about some of those very important matters. And nowadays, people's attention span has somehow become shortened and, and people would say, oh, why is that happening? I mean, the, 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 and that is why, I guess, the rise of independent media forms like podcasting, where you have people we talk for three hours straight at people. That's kind of the replacement of this legacy media 30 second bumper sticker level. I, I am so apologetic to my federal, to my fellow citizens if they don't have time to listen to uh, substantive answers on issues like foreign policy, healthcare, education, racial justice. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying I have no sympathy. I mean, democracy is hard work. Uh, it requires an educated citizenry. And if you're not willing to invest more than a couple of minutes, I mean, you mentioned the Lincoln-Douglas debates. You could certainly argue we had a higher caliber of person going into politics. So <laughs> maybe, maybe things would be different if we didn't try to tr treat serious issues in 90 seconds. I mean, 90 seconds is a joke for some of the issues that we're you know picking the leader of america over 90 seconds that's all you get well it's it's really interesting because there was a recent new york times article titled uh, talk radio is turning millions of americans into conservatives uh and it says uh, at least 15 million americans every week tune into one of the top 15 talk show programs uh, the overwhelmingly conservatives, they, they go on for three hours straight, uh, those radio programs. So in that sense, there are programs that are substitutes to the 30 second responses, and they, they really do go in very deep lens, but probably not nuanced perspectives. They're probably just trying to uh, dump a bunch of ideas on you. But, but, but it seems that there are this craving by the people of long form discussions, long form dialogues. Yeah. Far be it from me to disagree with the New York Times, but <laughs> who, who says talk radio is turning in them to conservatives? Maybe they were conservatives and that's why they switched on the dial. I mean, right. who, I mean, is the Times arguing that these were open-minded Americans who just happened to <laughs> happen to turn into Mike Gallagher or Rush Limbaugh or fill in the blank Sean Hannity? Is that their argument that these were neutral Americans until they started listening to talk radio? Probably not. Everyone does that. You, 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 you go in search of what validates what you already believe. Because it is much easier for me to find out what you believe and then ratify that. It is much harder for me to say, you know what, there's a better way. But let's talk about what that better way is. That's hard, which is why you don't ever see it done. It, it sounds like you're not very optimistic. I mean, especially with Whatever the rise of- Whatever gave you that idea? <laughs> Whatever gave you that idea? The rise of social media, the, the, the further reduction of our at, at, attention spans. What makes you think we can get out of this, this bad loop, this bad feedback loop? You know, um, I have a relatively happy life 
um, uh, not uh, caring what people that don't know me and have never met me and never have a conversation with me think about me. So I, I'm not on social media. Uh, whatever I send out via social media is um, I have to get somebody about your age to do it for me. And it's rarely, I almost always have a policy. I will respond to someone if they, you know, Elizabeth Warren said something about me that was just factually untrue. I had to respond to that. Or maybe it's good news or wishing Tim Scott or John Radcliffe a happy birthday. But, you know, I, <laughs> we cannot unlock the mysteries of the world in 140 characters or whatever you get in a tweet now. And, and exactly pushing but, the forward button on an email someone sent you that that is so easy to investigate whether it's true or not it's so easy there are so many sources to go figure out whether or not what you were sent is accurate but it's easier to just forward it to the people in your life that you think would agree with it regardless of whether it's accurate or not democracy so takes work but that goes back to my point, which is that millions of Americans do rely on social media and they do rely on a, as a predominant news source and they do rely, rely on legacy media, which is 30 seconds, uh, you know, CNN, uh, four screens debate window, you know, Fox News, all of those outlets, they do rely on this kind of form of media consumption. So that doesn't give much reason of optimism when we see that's the dystopian future of how Americans will receive their information. Well, and this facts. will be the surest sign you'll ever have that I'm never running for office again. <laughs> may, may, maybe they need to do better. Maybe they need to expect more of themselves. I mean, I, I, look, I did really poorly in math, like really poorly. I'm pretty sure they're the exact same number of hours in a day now as there were 100 years ago. I'm almost positive about that. Yes. Yes. So how they apportion their time and what they place value in and which opinions they place value in. I mean, look, we have a First Amendment. You have the right to say what you want within certain parameters, but I don't have to pay attention to it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, how stupid would it be for me? I mean, I'm a huge Dallas Cowboy fan. I love Dak Prescott. So I'll pick on Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott's great at lots of things. But if I've got something wrong with me medically, I mean, Dak Prescott's welcome to weigh in and give me his opinion, but I'd be stupid to follow that over the opinion of my physician, right? Right. So, so why do we care about some of the opinions that we read about in social media? I mean, what, what makes him or her qualified to add more value to a topic than someone else? So I, I look, your generation is a lot different from mine. I know it sounds like heresy to suggest spending less time on social media, but I, I mean, unless there are experts in their respective fields weighing in, I mean, why would you? Why would you? Exactly. Teenagers are so interested in building their online personalities that having some scholars telling them that this is not really healthy isn't really going to deter anybody to, to do so. But I, so I guess that's on the people's side, but what about, let's say, the legislative branch, the, the Congress or, or the political sphere? I mean, uh, we've had a, a Princeton professor, Julian Zelazer, who wrote this book about Newt Gingrich and said Newt Gingrich was one who started the part hyper-partisanship on, on Congress. And, and how would you describe the, the current political discourse in, in America today? I mean, it seems that both sides are blaming each other for, for being partisan. And, and, uh, hopelessly fractured. Winning is the only thing that matters. Um, Ends justify means. Yeah, I think someone famous uh, may have may have uh, may have written that before uh, you and I came up with it. <laughs> it is so antithetical to being in a courtroom where evidence is suppressed if you don't do it the right way, even if you have the quote right person. Confessions are suppressed if you don't do it the right way and properly Mirandize. The person. It is a process centric system, the justice system. And in politics, it doesn't matter what I need to say about you. I have, I have rationalized in my mind that our country is going to hell in a handbasket if you win. And therefore, when I have rationalized that in my mind, that this country as we know it is over if you win, then I'm free to do whatever I want because I'm really just doing it to save the country. 
And so if, if, if I have to misrepresent someone's position, if I have to make up stuff about them, if I have to, you know, take 25 years of public service and reduce it down to one vote to win. The, I think one of the differences between me and others is, is I, I blame both the person doing it and the people fooled by it. I, I mean, I, I blame the voter if they are fooled by that kind of nonsense. The, winning is the only thing on the minds of most people in politics. By whatever means necessary, I think that may have been said by someone else famous. So you can have the end justifies the means, and I'll go with by whatever means necessary. I guess this is a more fundamental question. So, uh, from you're a lawyer, you're a prosecutor. So from a legal perspective, or basically from a normative perspective, what do you think is the role of government in the sense that uh, what reforms would you advocate for? Do you think we need a fundamental rethink? of the way the, the, the government or the legislative branch currently works? Um, it, depends on how, it depends on how you view the First Amendment and whether or not the First Amendment protects demonstrably false statements. I mean, it's almost impossible to successfully sue a public figure. Uh, you have to have malice. Um, back when I was in Congress, we had, we had a hearing with kind of the social media titans. And this hearing, I think, was on a Tuesday. So I said, why do you protect someone who says today is Thursday? It is demonstrably false. I mean, that's not an opinion. Today is not Thursday. So wh what is the value to our culture in allowing someone to say something that is false? And their answer shocked me. As long as you are accurate with your identity, we're not going to police the content. We are interested if you misrepresent your identity. So I got to be honest with you. That makes no sense to me. Someone who is lying about who they are, but yet telling the truth about the substance offends me a lot less than someone who is telling the truth about who they are, but lying about the substance. So we don't, we just made a decision in our culture that we're going to put up with lies. And that's back to my point. Who is the societal arbiter? Who decides whether or not someone is in bounds or out of bounds? And, and it, it ought to be the media, but just trust me when I tell you, uh, folks on the right don't trust the New York Times and the Washington Post, and folks on the left don't trust Fox News. So you know, rightly or wrongly, they're out as a commonly accepted societal arbiter. Well, I think the Russian literary giant uh, Sojaniskin said uh, media is more powerful than all three branches of the government or something. So uh, it comes back to how, how that dictates people, the way people think and, and the social norms of we, how we communicate with each other. But I guess you brought up this very important question, which is content moderation or censorship. It seems that people are very against the government coming up with the legislation and say, listen, social media platforms, you have to censor this. I, I think people don't want that. Uh, people on both of the left, left and right don't want that. And, and the social media companies are not really incentivized to have a consistent policy, as we saw with even with the recent Hunter Biden story, whatever, because they make money off of clicks, right? The, the, the more pol polarizing the information are, the more they profit. So Again, it does not seem to have a way out. From, from a legal perspective, do you have any take on how we might be able to address this, this issue? Well, if I were still in politics, um, I would probably try to get a little better understanding of what exactly their policy is, because I'm having a dickens of a time following the social media titan's policy. I'll give you an example. Um, disseminating classified information is a crime. You agree with me on that? I mean, there, there, there's, a, there's a federal statute that says you cannot unlawfully disseminate classified information. Yes. Do you ever see stories that contain classified information posted on social media? I mean, it happens all the time. The New York Times and Washington Post make a living uh, disseminating classified information. So the policy certainly cannot be we're not going, we're not going to propagate the proceeds of a crime. Back when Hillary Clinton's emails were being uh, widely distributed, I thought that was terrible. Whoever stole her emails, I mean, the content is irrelevant. The emails were stolen. So why would you 
essentially reward criminal activity by disseminating the proceeds of a crime. But, but if you're going to stop it there, it's the exact same analysis when classified information is leaked to the Times or the Post. Uh, they win awards for printing that stuff. So I need to know what their policy is before I can figure out whether or not it's a good policy or not. I see. Um, I guess it goes back to our very beginning of the debate. So when, when you wrote this book with Senator Tim Scott, uh, unified how our unlikely friendship gives us hope for a divided country. And most recently, your book uh, doesn't hurt to ask. It seems that you're very passionate about the issue of trying to bring the country back together, reduce the polarization. Um, if now you're just speaking to someone in politics, or not in politics, just an average American, what would you suggest to be the steps, specific steps that they could take to reduce the sense of polarization in their life or in their social surroundings? What would you tell them? Understand the difference between contrast and conflict. Reject conflict. Uh, pursue relationships with people who don't look like you, don't think like you, don't worship like you. Um, I am convinced, and you got to keep in mind, I was a homicide prosecutor. I have a very low opinion of mankind, a very low opinion of mankind. But even with that low opinion of mankind, I think about 80% of us have 80% of life in common. But we commercialize the conflict. I mean, the, the members of the House and Senate that get along with each other do not make it on air each night. They don't have stories written about them. It is always conflict. Go look at the headline sometime on Politico or The Hill or Roll Call. It is never someone questioned somebody. It's they grilled them. I mean, I was in Congress for eight years. I didn't see that many grillings. I didn't even see that many effective lines of questioning. But people profit from conflict. So it will stop when we decide we're just tired of it. I, I, I um, live with someone who politically could not be more different. I mean, I, I would struggle to find many political issues that we agree on. And I love her as much as I do anything in the world. I prioritize the relationship over whatever differences we have. Now, if they're not family or they're not close friend, maybe you'll decide, well, it's not worth it. I, I it just, I'm a lot older than you are. So you just gonna have to trust me on this. <laughs> if you try hard enough, you can find something you have in common with almost everyone. Yes. The, the issue is, are you going to spend the time to do it? Or are you just going to say, you know what, uh, you're a different religion, or you're a different gender, or you're a different political orthodoxy, and therefore, um, I'm not interested in the rest of I, I, some of the people I got the most out of the eight years I was in the house were some of the most progressive people on the other side of the aisle. And when I say got the most out of, I mean, in terms of the way their mind works, but also their character, which is what good people they were. So, I mean, little known secret, I don't want to, I, I don't want to ruin people's expectations of Congress. Most of us get along most of the time. What you see on television is not reflective of our normal day. There's no arguing in the halls. There's no arguing in our offices. <laughs> There's no arguing at dinner. We get along, but then we, from seven to 10 at night, want you to think that we're at war with each other, and we're not. In your book, you wrote that you left Congress with a higher opinion on mankind than when I left the courtroom. So, that, so that's, I, I, that's, I guess, where this comes from. In, in a world where general populace remains cynical about American politics, uh, extremely cynical about American politics, do you think that's the, the relationships that, that drove you to, to leave with a higher opinion on mankind, not the, not the work itself? Well, I mean, you got to keep in mind, <laughs> I prosecuted murderers and rapists <laughs> and domestic violence perpetrators. So, I mean, I, I, it ain't a high bar to be better than where I was. <laughs> Um, I, I will I will say this, um, you know, Peter Welch is one of the most decent human beings on the face of the earth from, from Vermont. Uh, Joey Kennedy from Massachusetts uh, will never vote for me. I'll never vote for him. 
but I would trust him with some of the most important things I have in life. Kirsten Sinema from Arizona, Tulsi Gabbard uh, from Hawaii, Hakeem Jeffries from New York. We just disagree on the size and scope and role of government. But, but that's not enough to say that. So what you, I mean, you can't have a nuanced debate. It has to be, you're going to turn the country into this, or on the left, the trope now is they're coming after your rights. Yes. I mean, I, I, I watched this mother of seven who apparently is coming after every right that we have. And I don't know if the senators are dumb enough to really believe that or if they have to say it because their base expects them to say it. I, I don't know. Um, but, but it seems that people often extrapolate a small disagreements on specific issues into character issues, right? So people on the left, during the Black Lives Matter movement, even in Princeton, there's a lot of debates between students and students often say, oh, if you're a racist, uh, if you don't agree with this, you're immediately racist. And if you're a racist, I won't talk to you. And the people on the right would say, oh, if you support Bernie Sanders, whatever, you're a communist. And if you're a communist, uh, you want to turn this country to be this, I, I just won't talk to you. You're not in the sh same shared reality with me. You don't even acknowledge climate change. And people use, uh, so do you think that's an issue or, or that's a natural conclusion for people to arrive at to say, because you and I disagree so much on such an important issue, it shows some fundamental disagreements in our morality or character that I just simply cannot interact with you anymore. Well, my response to that is this. Um, you will never, ever understand how President Obama was elected president twice if there's no one in your life that voted for him. And you will never understand how Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton in 2016 in the Electoral College if all you do is hang out with the philosophy department at Princeton because <laughs> there's no one there that voted for him. So if you really want to understand understand the nuance that is most people, you have to have a conversation with them. And I can't think of anything that, that shortens a conversation more than calling someone a socialist or a communist or a racist or a misogynist. The, the question is, do the people saying it really believe it? When, when Senator Harris says they're coming after your voting rights, they're coming after your reproductive rights, does she really believe that? Or does she just think we're dumb enough to believe it? That's the question. And I don't know the answer to it. I mean, she wasn't one of my friends. I was never around her. I think most of my Democrat friends in Congress, Peter Welch is, is a fantastic example of this. He does not agree with Republicans on the issue of life and when it begins and how, if at all, it can be regulated by the state. He does not agree with us at all. But he makes an effort to understand why we believe what we believe. He makes an effort to do it. It hasn't persuaded him on the merits, but I think it has in some instances persuaded him on the people who hold a different view. So if you want to start a conversation by calling someone a name that ends in IST, uh, that's going to be a short conversation. And that's how you get to a 50-50 country. Um, where both sides think the world's going to end if the other side is elected. Uh, you said that you were a lot older than me, so I, I'll, <laughs> I'll ask you a question based on that. So uh, throughout your career, or, or since you had memories, do you think the country is the most polarized at the current moment? Do you think political discourse was much better uh, in an older time where people didn't used to uh, call each other ists, but, but actually ended up debating nuanced issues? Did that time ever exist? Well, I was just a boy during the Civil War. So I don't, I, my guess is that, that was a pretty fractured time in our country's history. Um, I would think, um, you know, it's hard for me to imagine that there was ever a time when women could not vote. Uh, and I'm not a woman, so I don't know what it's like to have to go through life thinking that I am not worthy to even cast a vote over who my elected officials were. I was born in the 60s, but I don't remember separate water fountains, separate restaurants. I, I don't, so all I know is what I've been around for. Um, I think Republicans probably thought the world was going to end when Bill Clinton was elected. I'm pretty sure they thought the world was going to end when President Obama was elected. Um, I know Democrats thought the world was going to end when uh, George what? Bush and Donald <laughs> Trump were elected. And yet here we sit 
So, uh, you know, obviously uh, you can make a lot of money telling people the world's going to end if this happens. At some point, the people spending all the money are need, they just need to be smart enough to say, you know what? It's going to be a different four years, but we've made it through other tough four year patches. Uh, so you think politicians need to stop being, you know, even quote unquote, so patronizing to their constituents. They need to be able to trust their constituents and say, you can not believe and you can uh, reason through more nuanced narratives. And I'm going to give you those more nuanced narratives and, and, and not resort to uh, those punchlines that rile up people and then trust the con constituents to, to make the right decisions I, from there. I don't blame the politicians entirely. I also blame the people that fall for it. I mean, I see. yeah, do politicians need to act different? Sure. <laughs> do the voters need to be smart enough to know when there's a snake oil salesman or saleswoman talking to them? Yeah, they need to be smart enough to know. I mean, it doesn't take that much for me to think, you know what? I didn't agree with President Obama on much. Um, Joe Biden was his vice president. Um, but after eight <laughs> years of Barack Obama, we got Donald Trump. So is Joe Biden really going to be the end of civilization if he wins next Tuesday? And as I like to tell my progressive friends, look, you survived already four years of President Trump. I mean, maybe you can survive <laughs> another four. I, I just, I, I don't like the hyperbole. I mean, our country's, I mean, when, when broad swaths of people are viewed as inferior citizens, not allowed to vote, uh, we, we've, we've had some rough patches in this country. It's not just recently. Mr. Gowdy, the, the progressives would probably vehemently disagree with you and say, no, no, look at the how much lack of progress we're making on climate change. Look at how much damage Trump has done in, in the courts, in, in social discourse, for racial minorities, for inequality. So, um, yeah, so at, at least at the moment, they might disagree with you about the urgency uh, of the and election. My, and, and my response would be, you mean un, un, undo all the stuff that Biden and Obama did for eight years? Because I don't remember criminal justice reform being passed under President Obama and Vice President Biden. I, 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 maybe, maybe I missed that. I remember having lots of conversations with President Obama, not lots, but some conversations with President Obama about criminal justice reform. But when they had the House, the Senate, and the White House for two years, what was their priority? Their priority was health care. So the Republicans, I think, had what the House, the Senate, and the White House for two years, and I'm not real sure what the priority was. Um, but but all the things that people were afraid were going to happen, uh, the American people apparently have a sense of humor because they don't let you have the House, the Senate, and the White House very long. <laughs> they gave it for two years to President Obama, and they gave it for two years to yes. President Trump. Right. Um, I, I guess perhaps we should look a little bit forward looking to, to the elections. I know you don't have too, too much time left. Uh, we want, want to get you out soon. But who do you think would win the election? Do you have any predictions? Uh, who do you think would make a more effective leader during this era of global crisis? Um, do you have any takes on this? I have no idea who's going to win the election. I didn't know in 2016. I, I don't, I do think there is some legitimacy to the notion that there is an undercount for President Trump. And there may be an undercount for, uh, for Republicans in general. I'm not a polling expert. I don't know how they decide, you know, what kind of numbers uh, to include in their poll. Here's the good thing. I know that hopefully, God willing, on Wednesday at some point, we're going to know who won all of these races, and I won't have to guess. We'll know. We'll know who won the presidency. We'll know who runs the Senate. We'll know whether or not McCarthy is going to be the next Speaker of the House. We'll know that in about a week. By the way, I really need to ask you more about that because I, I read it, something that says only there's only 15 to 20 percent likelihood that we have a clear winner on election night, and um, we'll probably have you know, no chance of really, because of mail-in voting, because of everything, from a legal perspective, are you worried? Yes. It, also, yes. given the, the polarization, right? Yes, I, I am worried. I'm really worried if it looks like someone is prevailing Tuesday night, and then the result changes because of uncounted ballots, which is why my idea, and I don't have very many good ones, and I have very few original ones, start voting early. 
but have it all done that night. I, I think Americans have the right to expect that they are going to know by the time they go to bed, or at least early when California and the other Hawaii, Alaska, and those states come in, I don't think we ought to be sitting around on December the 1st, not knowing who the leader is going to be for the next four years. I just think it's unfair to the country. So if you want to start voting in August, I don't care. And um, you should. And you sh we, we probably I, should encourage I, people to do. I, which means we need to back the debates up. Because if people are debating after everyone's already voted, I don't know what the purpose of the debate is. Right. Um, I would like to know on election night, because nature abhors a vacuum. And, and if there is uncertainty, then that's going to sow the seeds of doubt. And, um, you know, I'm not in this camp. But there are people that are, I'm sure there are progressives that just cannot imagine that President Trump could win. And I know that there are conservatives that cannot imagine that he won't win. So if you go to bed thinking there's no way in the world your candidate can lose, and then a week later, <laughs> it just, look, I, I think it's really, really, really possible that my candidates can lose. Uh, I, 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 you know, look, I'm, uh, Lindsey Graham's a really, really, really good friend of mine. I love him to death. But if you told me Tuesday night that Jamie Harrison narrowly beat him, um, I'm not going to say the only explanation is voter fraud. I, I'm, that, I'm just not wired to do that. Uh, are you afraid that the Republican parties, are you concerned that they might claim voter frauds or, or resort to some of those things? Well, if not just the Republican party. I'm concerned that anybody who perceives that they lost uh, <laughs> is going, and again, we lack, we lack a consensus referee in this culture. I mean, I did a podcast and there's no reason for you to ever listen to it. Um, but I did come <laughs> up with this. If the election came down to one box in one, one county, in one state, one box, and it hadn't been counted yet. So I want you to think back in the old days, paper ballots. We got one big wooden box. Who do you trust enough to go count those votes? And if he or she walked out, you would say, you know what? That takes care of that. They say that this person won. I believe them. Who, who, who would be that person for our country? The Supreme Court. But then we just confirmed... Uh, Judge Barrett in a highly politicized you process. You cannot believe that most Americans would believe the Supreme Court, not after the way we politicized it. Right. No, I mean, it, maybe it should be the Supreme Court, but they're going to say, well, Kavanaugh was put on by Trump and Gorsuch and, and, and Barrett, Tony Barrett, and yeah. Elena Kagan and Sotomayor and Breyer <laughs> are Democrats and so no, there. I mean, who in our culture do you believe if they were to walk out? I mean, you believe Oprah? Maybe we can do Kanye West. I mean, he is also a presidential candidate that could be. A... <laughs> he might. Uh, he might have a conflict of interest since he's yeah. on the ballot. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's been a wonderful talking to you. I guess the last question I would have is, uh, the name of our podcast is Policy Punchline. So at the end, what would be your punchline for for? Uh, either your career or your thoughts on political discourse or for this interview, the upcoming elections, anything, what would be your punchline? Um, that we're living in a 50-50 country and I for one don't want to die in a 50-50 country. So um, may the best argument win, may the person with the best facts presented in the most compelling way win. Um, but we gotta start having conversations with people that don't look like us and think like us and worship like us. Um, most of us have a lot of life in common. If we just look for it, just look for it. How can people learn more about your work? You have two, two most recent books out. You also host a podcast on, on uh, a Fox News, the Trey Gowdy podcast. Anything else that, that you would encourage people to uh, yeah, do? Yeah, I, I, I got two kids. I love to tell them I got six jobs. Um, <laughs> I, I do have a podcast. I enjoy doing it. Um, you know, I'm on television a little bit, but uh, there are lots and lots of sources for, I mean, you expose yourself to a variety of viewpoints as long as the you know, person is reasonably um, 
well-researched and present somewhat compelling arguments, expose yourself to as many different views as you can and see which one resonates the most, the most with you. Um, I, this whole experiment in self-governance only works with an educated moral citizenry and people define morality differently, but education, access as much information as you can, assuming it's reliable, um, and then make up your mind. Um, yeah, you can get on one of those little things that Al Gore invented, uh, the internet. You, you can find me anytime you want to find me. Thank you so much for being here with me, Mr. Mr. Gaudi. Well, that concludes this episode of Policy Punchline. Please visit us on policypunchline.com and go uh, follow Mr. Gaudi's work. Uh, this is Policy Punchline's ongoing elections coverage. Thank you so much for listening today. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.